Now let's begin with this afternoon sessions and the first panel discussion we have for this afternoon will focus on how creatives and the design industry are representing each country, but more importantly, how they can be useful in shaping both cultural appeal and of course and of course cultural awareness as well, and how they are driving mutual growth here in the ASEAN region. May I please call on stage our next set of speakers, beginning with the Department Chair of Japanese Studies in the Ateneo de Manila University, Dr. Carl Cheng Chua. We also have uh, one more speaker here. Can we please flash the name on screen? With, uh, the co-founder of 98B Collaboratory, Ms. Mayumi Hirano. Again, thank you so much to our speakers and our collaborators here on stage right now. Uh, we can start off uh, ladies first or gentlemen first. Okay, please. Very good. Um, actually, I, first I have to apologize because uh, I'm not really a design person, but I'm actually a Japanese. I'm actually a Japanese studies person, and um, what I prepared are um, just a, a simple talk on how Japan was able to work with soft power. Um, is this screen ready? Yeah. For it? Yes. All right. So the next slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of what um, what soft power is. Uh, just the next one. Um, so it's just divided, developed by Joseph Nye on uh, 1980, which just talked about how to convince people uh, about a particular concept. Very different from let's say propaganda. Um, and this is quite important for Japan, especially since what the, one of the things that we have to understand is Japan had recently undergone its um, World War II and was trying to build its reputation um, with its neighboring countries. And that is why in 2002, um, what they did was they developed the Cool Japan Strategy. Um, next slide, please. Um, but why? Um, so one of the reasons that we have to talk about it, um, especially with Japan, is that one, it was trying to rebuild its reputation um, especially with its neighbors that was trying to uh, that was trying to, that was a little bit distrustful of it. But recently, since the 2002 um, policy, uh, it was now trying to address issues in its own country. One is diminishing demand. If you're able to see it in online, um, Japan's uh, population is shrinking. So that means from a market perspective, and I was just talking to Ms. Hirano about this, um, we now have a shrinking market. And hence, one way to actually sell creatives is to actually market it outside as well. Furthermore, um, conventional models in Japan no longer work. Um, what happened in Japan as a market used to be that it was fueling uh, a highly capitalist, um, highly consumerist market. Um, that's why when you go to Japan, you'll always see a lot of people buy, buying stuff and so on. However, the problem here is that with the shrinking population, you also have a shrinking market altogether. Right? So next slide, please. Um, however, there are problems now for Japan in how it's going to sell itself. And just to give you some ideas, um, if Japan wants to sell itself, um, outside, there are two ways it's able to do so, either in small, medium industries or at least um, small, well, in design, it's just small companies. The problem with small companies is that they have no ways of being able to um, do market studies. They don't have the capital to do so. Um, on the other hand, large companies, uh, and uh, I just give us a picture, let's say a small restaurant in Japan, it's not a company itself. But let's say um, a large company such as Ipudo, everybody's familiar with that. Um, on the other hand, Ipudo, which is a large corporation, will also have difficulty because these, while they have the large backings of corporate money, um, have not even envisioned to sell themselves outside. And at the same time, um, if these large companies want to sell themselves outside, they now have to deal with a domestic markets, meaning um, if, Ipudo was, if, if Ipudo was wanting to come to the Philippines, um, what are the structures involved? And that's part of the problem. At the same time, soft power in Japan is not just selling 
um, selling Japan outside, but also selling Japan so that we can bring people into Japan. Okay? Um, that's why we have the loosening of um, visa entries for a lot of people. Um, and part of the problem, oh sorry, um, can you go back please? Um, one more slide, go back, thank you. One of the problems here is um, in inbound, um, you have a non-network, a non-network individuals. So you have small companies, small cities, small projects that are wanting to sell themselves outside or they're wanting to promote themselves. The problem is um, with these small marketing concepts, they have no capacities to have large impacts in a global market. Um, uh, an example that I have there, uh, it's small, but if, you, um, if you're able to search it, Kobe City, and this is a city. Uh, Kobe is a city that um, tries to market itself as um, uh, its tourism strategy is feel Kobe. Uh, which try, and what you then have are um, ways for Kobe City to actually sell its own city. But the problem with that is, in order to enter Kobe City, they have to go through Osaka uh, as the international market. And what you have there is a problem of non-networks because Osaka itself will also have its own um, non-network um, inbound promotions. So that's part of the um, that's part of the lack of synergy. The other thing is. Um, in inbound, the domestic ignorance of cool. What do I mean by this? Japan wants to sell itself as cool, but what Japan, what Japanese think is cool, is not what others believe to be cool. Um, so how can you then? Um, and sometimes these marketings or sometimes these promotions might have um, uh, might might have. Um, lack of distinction. So I'll just give you an example. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to give you an example of a creative city. Uh, this was a project that was hosted by, uh, that was, uh, that, that was promoted, Creative Tokyo. What is the concept of Creative Tokyo? It was trying to, um, it was trying to build Tokyo as a creative city, as part of our theme. And um, what, uh, it began since 2012. And what it did was it tried to network all institutions that have the capacities to um, sell or at least to promote um, creative concepts. Um, to the, if you see the S sign label that's there, that's actually, um, it's a city in Tokyo called Sumida. Um, and it's actually known for um, doing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of um, handicrafts. And what they did was it was, um, they basically created uh, a project that they created in Tokyo where you collaborated with designers to repackage local products. In this case, if you search it, um, it's a collaboration between a designer and a coffee company. Right? Then we have the Art Fair Tokyo. Um, so they create events. Um, you also have um, soft power with, um, well, um, Doraemon, um, a museum, and um, an international manga, muse uh, international manga festival. But how is this possible? Um, next slide, please. Um, what we have to understand is um, for soft power to work for Japan, it actually needs a lot of um, government support. And while we think that it's quite easy, I'm sorry, this is not an updated one. Um, what I've only showed you are three. Um, the first is METI. It's their, uh, it's their economic sector. It's their economic um, office, which tries to make it easy for companies or for small businesses to not only um, sell themselves outside, but to also fund things. Uh, fund for a market study. At the same time, you have MOFA, um, the Foreign Affairs Office. Um, since Cool Japan is not necessarily just about trying to um, sell product, but to also make people come to Japan, 
um, the Foreign Affairs Office has to be part of it. And of course, tourism agency. What is not included here um, is uh, our two institutions, one of which is a funder here, Japan Foundation. Um, for the Philippines and for other countries in Southeast Asia, we do get, we do get a lot of um, uh, programs that um, introduce Japanese uh, culture. At the same time, um, there is, they also created a Good Design Award, um, which was funded by METI to award a lot of design companies, right? a lot of designs um, to which if you have the good design mark in your product, um, it creates this image of a cool Japan. It, uh, for Filipinos, you tend to think that Uniqlo, uh, Muji, and all these are great because they are made in Japan and so on. So it's part of that marketing. It's part of that soft power itself. But um, in my last point, um, next slide. Um, I have here, um, while we think that government is important, I'll just show you, um, can you click the bottom, pic, uh, the, the bottom um, video, just to give you how this works. Um, this is a video made by... This is a video made by 100 Tokyo. that live in it. So if you have no people that are able to create 
in your city, if you have no people to create, um, then there's not much a government can do um, to sell it. But before we can jump into the idea that then we have to look at art, what you will then notice from here, and going back to my point on the ignorance of pool, what you see here is it was created by, um, it, this is all made by tourists who just went to Japan. And what you see is how banal, how ordinary, um, what they interpreted as cool. So for a Japanese, like very simple thing, these things like the counters, um, the the the, ba the bathing and so on. That's why it's an ignorance of because they don't know that it's cool or they don't even know that it's actually seen as cool. Yet, when tourists then come or when people then come, they see the place in a different lens. And as a result, um, um, under a study that was conducted by um, Portland Communications on the Soft Power 30, um, Japan was able to actually garner out, out of 30 their number seven in soft power um, because um, not only do you have a large quantity of creators but even that a large quantity of people that are still in the aspect of this creation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much Dr. Carl. Let's give a round of applause please. And we'll save questions about your presentation. Uh, after uh, the presentation, of course, Ms. Mayumi Hirano of 98B Collaboratory. So again, thank you so much, uh, Mayumi, for joining us here today at the uh, CN Creative Cities Forum and Exhibition. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mayumi Hirano, and I am a co-founder co of 98B Collaboratory Manila, and I am based here in Manila right now, but I'm actually from Japan. And I'm very happy to be here in this panel to introduce Yokohama's Creative City Projects. And I would like to today focus on one specific project in this big project called Creative, Yoko, uh, Creative City Yokohama. And about 90B Collaboratory, our co-director will be talking about it tomorrow. So I hope you can make it to that session also. Okay, and sorry, I'm going to read so that I don't keep track. But. So Dr. Carl introduced the example of Tokyo, but mine is from Yokohama. Yokohama is only 30 minutes away from Tokyo, but it's a very different city. And so, okay. so I'm going to introduce a project in Yokohama, which I have been involved since its inception in 2008 as a curator. I am using this project as an example to discuss how soft power is applied to face socio-economic challenges within the context of local communities in Japan. Next slide, please. So this is something uh, Dr. Carl mentioned earlier, but today Japan is facing various social and economic challenges with a rapid economic growth in the late 1970s significant number of people migrated to large cities for work and eventually settled there. Consequently, people's lifestyle and life value have changed. Living cost has gone high up, which caused a decrease in birth rate, and senior citizens are only left in the countryside, making the situation hard for them to maintain the very basic condition to live in the countryside. Okay. Also, even in larger cities, the growth of global economic system and decrease of the entire population are making the situation hard for local, small, individual business to survive. People in the city spend most of their time at work and simply goes back home to sleep. A single person or nuclear family is the most common unit of a household in the city. Those elements together are destroying the sense of a neighborhood community that had been developing and succeeding local cultures, creating local economy, and maintaining the safety in the neighborhood. So to face all these social and economical challenges, art and culture are mobilized across Japan. 
soft power or creative energy generated through the process of cultural and artistic production is sought to nurture the ability to think and act flexibly, ability to find potentials in existing society, and develop open mindset to accept diversity. By nurturing a sense of empathy, soft power creates a platform for people to work collaboratively and share a vision and mission. So generally, these efforts to revitalize community by the use of artistic and cultural activities are called community art projects in Japan. And from Hokkaido in the north to Okinawa in the very south, various size efforts are currently made. Some are independent initiatives and others are led by government bodies. With pioneering, pioneering examples of creative city projects in Kanazawa, Niigata, and Yokohama, many prefectures are applying the formula as a strategy to promote the cultural identity of their own locality, facilitate cultural tourism and economic activities, and face social challenges in the locality. So I moved to Yokohama in 2005 to take the assistant curatorship with Yokohama Trenale in 2005. And I'm not the only one who moved to Yokohama because of the Trenale. Actually, this international art festival created a work opportunity for quite good number of young cultural workers and artists. And the Creative City project was able to continue creating job opportunities for them even after the Trenale, successfully keeping creative talents within the city. The planning of Yokohama's Creative City project started in 2001 with four goals. One, attracting artists, creators to reside in the city. Two, economic revitalization through development of creative cluster. Three, promotion of cultural tourism through utilizing local resources. Four, encouraging citizens' creative initiatives. Those goals are sought by four project frameworks. One, developing creative core or creative basis. Two, creating the image cultural city brand. Three, planning of national art parks. Four, organizing Yokohama Trenare. And today I would like to focus on introducing an example of the project framework number one development of creative bases in the city. The project reactivates unused existing buildings and even some historical buildings as a creative hub. This project is run by the cooperation, cooperative structure of three bodies, Yokohama City Government, Creative City Promotion Committee, and managing organizations. There are five projects, namely uh, Bank Art Studio NYK, Steep Slope Studio, Yokohama Creative City Center, Zonohana Terrace, and Cultural Hubs in Koganecho area. Here, I would like to introduce the effort of Koganecho area. This is a map showing where Koganecho area is located. It's located inland of Yokohama city center. To the Bay Area, it's about 30 minute walk. In contrast to the Bay Area, which is reclaimed and well developed, the Koganecho area still has the old downtown feel to it. The area called Koganecho is in fact a very small area along the train tracks between two stations. So this area, known and called Koganecho, was long known as a red light district. After the end of the World War II, American military base was laid across the river from Koganecho, and it grew as an entertainment district for American soldiers. Many shops were opened underneath the railway tracks in the chaos of the after-war time, and it remained contained underneath the railway tracks until late 90s, when the railway company started to push out those prostitute houses from the space underneath their railway tracks. Then the shops began to spread out throughout the area, and number of shops increased dramatically. This broke the balance which somehow kept the coexistence of the legal business and the illegal business, and local residents who were not involved in the business. Problem of violence and drug also got spread out throughout the neighborhood. Local residents and children couldn't enter the area anymore.
So most of the residents in Koganecho had to had their own small businesses in the area. But younger generations who grew up in Koganecho area had to move away from their family to keep the safety of life and also find a job. Because Koganecho was known as a place of sex industry, local people suffered discrimination when they were searching for schools, jobs, and marriage partners. So in 2005, long time effort of local residents to make the area livable was joined by the national government measure, which led into 24 hour long police patrol to close down this illegal business. The shop spaces were left abandoned, but it was clear that the mafias or yakuzas who were actually running this illegal business was just waiting for the time for them to bring back their business to this neighborhood. So this, uh, yes, and before this small area was controlled, territory, territorialized by seven Yakuza families. And in 2007, Yokohama Creative City Project started to designate Kobanejo area to become one of the cultural hub under their cultural policy. And the creative project began in 2018 in Kobanejo. The goals of Kogadecho's creative projects are one, to revitalize the existing community, which also faces the issue of aging population by applying soft power. Two, to create new creative community that rediscovers the potentials of the area. Three, to promote cultural tourism and support the local business as well as artistic and creative activities. So this is a structure of Kogadecho's project. In the middle, in the yellow, marked yellow, is Koganecho Area Management Center, who functions as the main body and as an administrative office. Then they collaborate with the local residents organization, Koganecho Cleanup Association, and residents communities, and another stakeholder is of course the railway company. They closely work with the city government, but also police department, which is quite unique with Koganecho's project. The Koganecho Area Management Center also works with artists and creators in the effort of revitalizing the community. So I would like to quickly go through the strategies they use. One, they work closely with architects and artists to reactivate the existing spaces. Former Brussels prostitute houses are turned into artist studios and residency studios. Some of these houses are rented directly by the Koganecho Area Management Center from the individual owners, and other uh, spaces are rented from the owners by the city government and passed to the organization for management. And they do projects on the facade to create uh, creative images to the landscape. And this is a public square built underneath the railway tracks. It's used for various events, performances, and gatherings, and we encounter kids playing during the day, people sitting, eating, and chatting. And these are creative studios built newly also under the railway tracks. There are actually five buildings made with different functions, as shop spaces, artist studios, workshops, gallery, and information center. The spaces newly made and renovated are rented out to artists, writers, designers, illustrators, and other creative minds as a studio or residential spaces. Currently, they manage 115 studio units, including offices and storage spaces. Last year, 50 groups of creators used these spaces as their studios. This residency program, or having artists actually working in the area, creates everyday opportunity for the local residents to be exposed to various creative practices and for the artists to get to know the local lifestyle and cultures. They eventually become neighborhoods to exchange ideas and information, thus creating a new community which would not exist otherwise. By utilizing these spaces, Koganecho Area Management Center engages in developing. Developing exchanges and networking with other organizations in Yokohama, Japan, and also with international organizations. 
the visiting artists and creators get to know the local artists and local residents through exchange programs. This is a unique characteristic of Kobanecho Area Management Center's residency program. And cooperation with the local community. With every project, the Kobanecho Area Management Center collaborates with the local residents and community. Artists join the local residents' effort in cleaning up the area, and local residents join the area development planning workshops hosted by the organization together with urban planners university professors, architects, and artists. Although they regularly run small events and exhibitions throughout the year, once a year they run an international art festival entitled Koganecho Bazaar, which is going to happen this year in August till November. So to conclude, next year they celebrate 10th year anniversary. Through the years of their continuous effort, working with the media, the image of the area has changed from a red light district to an art town, town of art. We do not encounter men looking for prostitutes, but instead we see people looking at artworks in the windows of the studios. However, in the reality, office, the office workers still get the harassment by the underground power, which still necessitates the cooperation with the police department. And more kids come to learn how to use artistic materials tools and ideas at artist studios, and local people have become familiar and flexible with new ideas. For artists, it's a platform to straight and apply their creative practice in the framework of actual society, going beyond the discourse of their own professional fields. The media attention to the Koganecho area became an interest for some developers. There are some landowners who gave up on their land to build a high-rise condominiums with only one room. This is something that the organization wished to prevent from happening, but to some stakeholders, cultural activities are not directly providing them a financial benefit in return. The revitalization of communities through art and culture cannot bring out quick result, especially in terms of the economic impact. It's a long time endeavor, just like how much it how much time it takes to grow a tree from seeds. We have to take care and wait until before we can get the fruits. It takes a long time commitment of stakeholders to cooperate and share the goal and act toward it. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Mayumi Hirado, Planet Dave Collaboratory. Let's give a round of applause, of course, to Dr. Carl. And before we begin with our Q&A, let's just uh, sort of consolidate what you were talking about so far. And if I looked at your presentation, Dr. Carl, it's a lot of what exporting your soft power, making yourself cool and, and seeing how you can turn it into an economic force outside. And if you look at uh, what Mayumi is looking at, it's like turning it inward, turning the soft power, creative power inside to revitalize communities or maybe some people use the word gentrify or change the change uh, local communities to make it more active, especially those which seem to be activated. Um, so let's get the ball rolling again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have our microphones at both ends of the room and also on the second floor. Please feel free to approach the mic, state your name and who you'd like to address uh, your question to at, at the same time. Uh, but uh, let me start off, Dr. Khan, with, uh, with asking about the question of cool. Because I find it very interesting when we talk about cool, it was something that, that the Japanese were not aware about, uh, but then people outside uh, knew that it was cool. So basically, how did the Japanese discover what uh, the outside world, the outside economy, would perceive as cool and turn that into a, and make it commercially viable. All right, um, this is where probably, unfortunately, a lot of people are wanting to hear about anime and manga, but I had to go out of it because that's my research. Um, what they notice is that soft power policy, cool Japan policy happened in 2002. However, what you will notice is that um, a lot of products without government uh, intervention or support had already been leaking out of Japan. Not my generation, but the generation before. 1990s was the age of Pokemon. Right? And what happens there? There was no active um, effort by the there was no active effort by the Japanese government to sell Pokemon. Yet outside consumers were attracted to it, and that caught the attention of, of Japan or the Japanese government that hey. We can Pokemonize the world in the same way that they were frameworking it in the same 
um, aspect as McDonald. Un uh, McDonald's. Unfortunately, McDonald's kasi naman is na it's not really uh, content oriented uh, or it's not creative oriented. You will also see that with um, anime and manga as well. So, um, having said that, now you've seen the example of the be best case studies coming out of Japan. Let's see how we can reapply it, let's say, here in, in the Philippine context. How can we identify what is cool here in the Philippines and what is potentially export of our soft power to the other ASEAN countries or maybe to, uh, to the rest of the world? Yes, true. Um, but part of it is also that problem which I mentioned, the domestic ignorance of cool. Um, we, a lot of people, do, for example, in Japan, they love eating our chocolate-covered dried mangoes. But we, we're not actually its main market for it. So it's that idea as well. The production was mainly created for that. Um, and it was able to push through. So is there a way to systematize this one so we can do it more, you know, we can grow the, grow the creative economy faster towards that direction? And it's probably where um, Ms. Hirano's project can come in. Encouragement of local creatives. Because, you know, with no product to sell, um, you don't know whether it's going to you're going it's going to market itself abroad or not. That's a good influence. Uh, Ms. Mayumi, talking about this one, you have been working with creative hubs both in Japan and over here. So the problem is that people sometimes they create a product, they don't know whether or not the product will be uh, is it interesting or is it exportable, is it cool, is it something with soft power? How can let's say at least Filipinos think of creating products which have which have soft power? Uh, is it something that you can identify? Is it something that you can catalog? Is it something that you can teach? So this is from my experience in the Philippines. But if I look at all these products locally produced, like in Paete, they make this taka, paper mache horses. And they, I can tell it's really, really handmade. It's not mass produced. So every horse look different and they have different expressions. And this kind of craft doesn't really happen in other cities in the world because they have bigger maybe number of tourists coming. So they have to eventually mass produce mm -hmm. these crafts. And on the surface level, it's okay because it's a souvenir. You want to take something from this place. But then the more you travel to the same place, you started to you start to feel like, oh okay, this is the same every time I go here and it's all the same. It's you know, it, there is no characteristic to it. But if I look at crafts from the Philippines, from paete or tobacco, uh, terracotta figures, they are very, very charming. So I think those are the things maybe people here can be very proud of. And we have to, I think we have to take advantage that still this industry, I think people are struggling financially, but it has lots of potential to actually use hands. And even if we look at like Japanese signs, it's all hand painted. Mm -hmm. And where in Japan can we see hand painted signs? No, it's all printed. I see. I see. So, so things, things which we don't think are cool anymore are actually cool for other people as well. Same like the, the this example of our hand painted signs or hand painted movie posters that they have uh, over here. Um, just to sort of, um, if you want a model, but this is the METI model, and I don't know. Sometimes a lot of METI projects, the, uh, the economic leg of Japan, sometimes it doesn't work. What they function under is a three-tiered um, three concept. Content and consumer goods, distribution and retail, and regional resources and international communication. What does that mean? First, you have to have content. But content itself, as what uh, Ms. Hirana has mentioned, does not necessarily mean that it's able to sell. Right? So what you have to then do is to think of ways for people to be able to consume it. Right? Um, in this case, uh, or it's the other way around. In this case, with the, the horses, uh, with, with, the, with um, the paper mache horses, how do you then create a consumer good out of it beyond its content? Then you then have to, if, then you have, to have issues of distribution and retail. Um, one of the ways of attracting people is to make it exclusive, meaning you have to go all the way to Payatas to buy it, but it might not be sellable. So one way of doing it is you create um, satellite shops, which is common in Japan. Um, something that is in Hokkaido, um, a lot of people like Royce chocolate. It's actually a Hokkaido brand. 
So they create venues for people to actually buy it outside of it. And finally, regional resources and international communication. So not only are you able to, um, you know that it's a local thing, how are you then able to sell it outside? Um, you sell it not just as an advertisement. Um, it can be in the most ubiquitous things, such as in, drama, in Japanese drama where you just have someone eating ramen. And as you see it, you become hungry for it. And what it unconsciously does not, um, what it unconsciously um, attracts you to is, oh my God, I want to eat ramen. I want to eat, and this is very uh, familiar for Filipinos. It's like, I want to eat authentic Japanese ramen <laughs> after watching these. So it, it's that three-year process that um, has, it has been able to sort of market itself as a soft power. See. Um, also, uh, going back to Ms. Mayumi again, uh, another question I have is, of course, when you introduce these creative hubs or, or, or turn these, these, these cities which have low energy in terms of culture into high energy culture spaces with uh, artists and design studios, you know, the, the bigger issue sometimes for, for, for businesses is that, you know, it's a long burden. How long do they have to wait until they actually, these creative spaces create, create money for this one? The, the local government unit is saying, okay, is that a good idea? I could, I could make better money giving this, uh, make, turning this to another mini mall. Um, what is the really of, of the, uh, in, when you, Yokohama, how long did it take, um, why did, uh, they could have just made it another mall? I mean, these, they could have just, just torn down all these old brothels and made them into mini, mini, mini marts. Uh, why specific the studios and how long does it take for it to revitalize the area? That's really a good question. Because Creative City Project in Yokohama is obviously political intention also. So it was proposed by the former mayor, and then the new mayor came, and she of course wants to change it. She wants to stop it. But then it's the local people who had the business said, no, we cannot, because it's somehow activating very small scale, like uh, activity of economic income for them. And also I think they enjoy this kind of uh, interaction with different mindsets of people. Because I think Japan has been known as a very rich, you know, like economically established country. But if we look at what's happening in Japan, there are lots of crimes that we can't really explain why. But because the uh, society is very convenient, so you can basically live alone. You don't have to talk to anyone. That's a very big contrast with here. Like if we take Jeepney, we have to give the money to someone else. So there is communication. But in Japan, there is no communication like that required. If you want to even buy ramen, you can just buy it in the vending machine and give the ticket to the shopkeeper. So I think now people are starting to think how to interact with people, how to get back to the normal life, because that's something we've lost. So, but of course, business has to grow always. So it's a constant struggle. And also politicians don't necessarily understand that. But as a culture worker, I have to advocate the importance of this soft power. Very interesting perspective. I understand. Yes, we have a question from the audience. Um, Paolo, yeah, Paolo Mercado of uh, Nestle. Can you have the uh, microphone, please? For those with more questions, please feel free to proceed to the mics. They, they are wired mics, so uh, you have to approach the mics. Hi, uh, good afternoon. So, Paolo Mercado from Nestle and also from the Creative Economy Development Council. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the Japanese uh, creative content, particularly film, uh, uh, not so much manga, but, but anime. One of the things, though, that I've noticed, and this is not fairly recent, uh, but it, it's been going on for some time, is the cultural appropriation of Japanese content by the West. So, um, and I wanted to know how, uh, how Japan feels about that. The most recent issue, of course, is uh, Ghost in the Shell, uh, where the lead character was uh, westernized um, as Scarlett Johansson, and interestingly enough, not produced by a Japanese company, but produced by a Chinese company. But this, this history of appropriation, in fact, a lot of the matrix was borrowed from or stolen from the Ghost in the Shell concept. And even before that, as early as the 1950s and 60s, where, uh, the Jap where uh, American Westerns, um, well, spaghetti Westerns, uh, particularly uh, the, the Magnificent Seven and, um, uh, and uh, a Fistful of Dollars, the Clint Eastwood one, 
they stole from Akira Kurosawa's film, Seven Samurai and Yujimbo. So I, I'd like to get a reaction from, from Ms. Mayumi on how does Japan feel about this appropriation? Is this welcomed or is it something that all uh, you, you hate it, that they, that they, they take it from you? Yeah. I th uh, thank you for the question. This is very personal <laughs> response because I haven't really done research, like data research about this. But Japan has been uh, developing the culture by involving or borrowing or stealing different cultures from abroad. So, uh, of course, we have very something Japanese authentic things, like you go to temples, but it's even coming from China via Korea. So, that's, we, I don't know how many population in Japan are actually aware of this, but Japanese tradition and history are hybrid of different cultures from long, long time ago. And what's happening in the contemporary Japan is also very much mixed. So I think uh, appropriation of Japanese content by like different countries are positive thing, I think, for Japan, because that's how people are interested and how they are appropriating it. But of course, when we look at the things that's made by foreign countries, it feels a bit strange because there is lots of interpretations. But that's probably what Japanese people have been done to other countries. Um, if you don't mind, I'll butt in as well. Probably um, one way of looking at it is a research by um, an American scholar called, um, they're, what they're doing is like it's media mix. What does it mean? You create something to which you have to repeat the process. Um, in various forms. So with anime, why, why anime is actually popular is not just because anime um, was created, but because um, after the anime has been finished, you still have ways to consume it either through food, merchandise, and so on. Um, and how I sort of um, backtrack away from, um, from media mix is, even piracy, or in your in what you mentioned, even the stealing of um, content actually replicates the original content. Um, and um, take note that in creation, um, part of it is um, in the Philippines. With anime, we have no markets here. We have no places to purchase all of these original goods. Yet, why is it that soft power is so strong here? It's, it's because of these of irregular channels to which if we have the capacities to actually um, purchase those items in the mainstream, we have to. Um, in the domestic spheres, uh, just to give an example, in the comics industry right now, a lot of people, a lot of com local comic artists are making their content available online. But um, what they then do is because they're trying to attract people to it, and in the end, once they are, once they are able now to um, create a product with it, which is a book, more people, people that are not consuming, uh, people that they thought were not going to consume it before, are now able to consume it because uh, it has been there. Uh, this might have issues with copyright, but as a scholar, <laughs> uh, I think of it in that way that you, as long as you keep on reproducing um, content, it creates, um, it has the capacity to um, keep on selling. Another question, please. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm Guy Delabad from MCCA and Bohol. From the National Commission of Culture and the Arts. And I'm very interested in the contribution of Ms. Mayomi, especially the Yokohama project. Uh, the NCCA and our groups in Bohol have, all, have been for a long time involved in heritage preservation and especially right after the earthquake, you know, revitalizing the population's uh, resilience for rebuilding. Uh, one of the major problems, not just in the world, but also I think across the country, is sustainability. I'm very curious how you're able to sustain the Yokohama project uh, with the problems of the political intervention because of change of leadership, which is also a very Philippine problem. And I'm wondering how much intervention the government has installed in your city, what level of participation the communities engage themselves with in your city, how much intervention the artists and the cultural leaders are engaged, and how much 
private private corporations are also engaged. Uh, what are key processes, and has, this, has there been an impact evaluation on your project to warrant it to be a creative city in a very sustainable way? Thank you for the question. And it always has been a challenge for the creative city Yokohama and people involved in this project. But uh, what the project I introduced earlier, Kobanecho project, is very special because it's not only talking about creatives or artists, but it also talks about the community and the safety and also urban development. So it involves different sectors of people and that somehow makes uh, our project more charming for politicians somehow. But there is other creative hubs that are only specialized in arts. And those are the ones who are getting very significant cut of budget. So now they have to engage in like money making, money flow projects. But they actually do it schooling. So they create alternative schools to share the knowledge. Instead of, they don't really sell products, but it's more about life learning skills or also interactions. And uh, you brought up about the earthquake in Boho, and in Japan we have lots of disasters. But we learned, because as I mentioned earlier, there is no interpersonal communication in Japan now. So when these disasters happen, we can't really tell who died and who is still there. So people started to realize, especially in Tokyo, you know, people don't know who lives next to you. But running this kind of project, opens up your door because there is something happening, something weird. So that's a way for you to know who is living in your community. So, yeah. um, Just to also include here, because um, it's not just about artists, community, and government as well, because of course there's limited funding here. Um, part of the Tokyo Creative Tokyo project is also you work with local industries who have also have a strong stake um, in it so much so that when government, um, in the case of uh, Ms. Mayumi, when she, when government tries to pull out um, funding, local industries or local businesses would now try to push or become more aggressive. Then, now this is a good project. Why can't we continue with this? Um, and uh, it it sort of fills the gap in between us all. So it's never just going to be about arts and government alone. It's not going to be about individuals and so on. But industry also may have a role if the community allows industry to be part of it. A round of applause, please, for Dr. Chua and Ms. Thank you so much for the insight.